Good. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Chris Knudsen. Uh, welcome to the uh, December 2016 EMS Medicine Live uh, online conference. Um, as always, uh, we're trying to bring together EMS physicians from across the country to uh, share their knowledge and experiences with uh, EMS fellows, other EMS physicians, and kind of community doctors across the country. Um, I do want to say we have with us today uh, David Tan. Uh, he is uh, the best EMS doctor in the world. Uh, I was going to tell, say that out loud. Um, he is a, uh, a, a emergency medicine physician out of uh, Washington University in St. Louis. Um, he has multiple EMS physician uh, roles, including uh, law enforcement, uh, can work with response teams out there, and also is the, I think, the treasurer for NASP uh, as well. Uh, and today he's going to be talking about uh, medical response to uh, in tactical medicine. So with that, I'll give it to Dave. Thank you very much, Chris. I really do appreciate the invitation to speak and I uh, add my welcome to everyone else listening today. Um, I'm talking about medical response priorities in active violence incidents and um, especially with the events that happened yesterday, it's kind of a, a, an unfortunately fitting topic to talk about amongst ourselves. Uh, my, uh, as Chris mentioned, I have a, a few affiliations um, I am the um, chief of the EMS section here at WashU. Um, I am a medical director for EMS police and fire agencies around here, specifically AMR and locally our St. Charles County uh, Police Department and SWAT team. Um, <clears throat> and I do serve on the national faculty for the CONTOMS program out of the Department of Health and Human Services. I do not have any pharmaceutical or product conflicts of interest to, to, to disclose, however, so just get that out of the way. Uh, our objectives today are pretty simple. I, I want to de define the term active shooter, um, describe some current trends and some lessons learned from these incidents, and maybe suggest to folks out there some resources, some plans, maybe some training ideas that will help reduce loss of life when these incidents occur, and maybe how to integrate with law enforcement in maximizing the number of lives saved. I would also surmise that a lot of you have opportunity to teach practical skills like use of a tourniquet, particularly to uh, law enforcement colleagues. And I do want to highlight a few um, do's and don'ts that are often missed when teaching use of the tourniquet, especially something like this, the, the CAT. So we'll go over that as well. Um, just a really quick reality check. There are classes ranging from two days to two weeks dealing with things like this, like active shooter response and such. We don't have that much time, obviously, so this will be a pretty brief overview and introduction. However, I'm hoping that it'll serve as a stimulus for you to uh, seek more information. I think um, things like the events at Sandy Hook were something that uh, is something that we will all remember and remember where you were when you heard of it happening it was so horrific where 27 kids were were shot um, on December 14, 2012. Uh, what a lot of people don't remember or don't even realize still is that on the exact same day uh, in China, 22 children were stabbed at, at the Chenpeng Village Primary School. And I think obviously because we were uh, suffering our own tragedy here in the States and the fact that it's halfway around the world maybe it didn't get as much press. But the fact of the matter is, it doesn't have to be an active shooter. That's why um, there's a move now to call these incidents active violence or active killer or um, hostile events because it doesn't have to be a shooter, but it can be a, uh, an active stabber in this case. And of course, as I mentioned yesterday in Berlin, uh, at least 12 people, maybe more, were killed by a driver who plowed into a crowd of holiday shoppers there in, in Berlin. So this whole concept of an active assailant is, is more the overarching theme of what I'm talking about today. The active killer, whether it's shooting, stabbing, driving, what they're trying to do is kill as many people as possible within the shortest time frame possible, largely because they know that as soon as the killing starts, somebody somewhere is gonna try and stop them and they have limited time. And what these killers are looking for is a, a lot of times is notoriety. Um, they want a body count. Uh, they're not gonna meticulously start looking for people. They're looking for 
for targets of opportunity, more or less. So um, they're just looking for a body count and looking for as many people as possible. And unfortunately, we know from experience that this killing will continue until something or somebody stops them or applies pressure. And of course, the single historical event that radically changed police response to the active shooter or the active killer was, anybody out there? Yes, Columbine. So April 1999, it was about 47 minutes before law enforcement countermeasures were introduced. Now, to be absolutely clear, I'm not um, uh, disparaging or criticizing uh, the law enforcement response in Columbine at the time, because back in April 1999, that is exactly what they were trained to do. They were trained to surround, call out, and activate SWAT with an active shooter or active killer. But of course, we remember that the public outcry was so loud after that happened that the police radically changed their tactics and the way they handle the active shooter and the active assailant. And to their credit, they realized that standing around while kids were being killed inside of school was not acceptable. And they changed completely across and across the country how they managed that situation. But what about EMS? What have we done to, to change our, our tactics and our response in an active assailant? situation. Well, you, re you recognize this picture from much more recently, the Aurora, Colorado theater shootings, where the vast majority of the victims were actually transported by police vehicle and, and not by ambulance. And a, a lot of it was due to logistical reasons that all, uh, in other words, a lot of the ingress and egress routes were blocked by law enforcement vehicles. That is true. But a lot of it also had to do with the fact that uh, a lot of um, EMS systems are still teaching stage and wait, stage and wait for police to make the scene safe or, or secure. And uh, there has been a public outcry over that as well. So I think we have to think about how do we respond. If law enforcement has changed, we probably should as well. Now, in general, when you're thinking about active shooter incident. There's generally two types. There's a spontaneous or near spontaneous uh, incident where um, the, the targets are, the, the casualties are usually more targeted, that the shooter kind of just snaps. It's not as well orchestrated. It's kind of sporadic. And as a result, there's typically some fewer casualties. But then uh, the more lethal incidents are the ones that are planned. Um, the shooter takes time to actually set up countermeasures and kill zones. Uh, responders are often targeted. And the perpetrator knows that they're going to die at the scene. In fact, they plan on it. So then, if we feel that EMS response has to be different or better, what then are our options? Option one, we can just say, okay, we're going to just act, enter active scenes, saving as many lives as possible now. So that's one extreme. Option two, do what we largely have been doing, which is stage and wait until the scene is declared safe by police before going in. Or maybe option three, consider a more focused, measured response in partnership with law enforcement to minimize loss of life as much as possible. And I would add maximize, at least as reasonably possible, our own safety. And I, I think most of you will guess that I would advocate more for option three, where we begin to, to, to compromise a little bit and create maybe a focused and measured response instead. So after the Sandy Hook tragedy, a group of stakeholders got together and discussed developing some consensus that would help increase survivability in mass casualty incidents, specifically mass casualty shooting incidents. And the group came to be known as the Hartford Consensus, and they, they came up with many recommendations, one of which uh, was an acronym called THREAT. Now, I think um, they would agree that none of the ideas uh, in the THREAT acronym are new necessarily, 
But what is novel, what is helpful, I think, is the fact that it is a easy to remember, easy to teach acronym that also, luckily enough, largely follows the priorities of medical care for these types of incidents. So T-H-R-E-A-T, as you can see on the screen, standing for threat suppression, hemorrhage control, rapid extrication, the safety assessment and transport. I think what is more difficult for us as fellowship directors, EMS physicians, educators for our EMS crews is teaching the when and where during intense tactical situations when to do when to do these things. So teaching the medical part is relatively easy in my opinion. Um, they're medical providers for goodness sake, so they get it. But teaching again when and where to do these things is is quite another. I think there is a common uh, misconception out there that you have to take your EMS crews and send them to SWAT school and send them to tactical medic school. Now, I would certainly not be opposed to that in principle, but to be clear, tactical medics is not the same thing as medics using tactics. Hmm. And I think that's where a lot of confusion comes in. I think well-meaning administrators want to send uh, their docs or their paramedics or EMTs to SWAT school and, and tactical paramedic school, but to un understand something that the priorities of a SWAT medic are are very different from a medic using tactics. A SWAT medic's main priority really is the team, overall health and well-being of the team. Yes, they will take care of casualties if they can, but still their number one priority is the team. Um, I think it is important to realize that these tactical medics who are assigned to a SWAT team are trained to support the law enforcement operation and law enforcement procedures, and their health and well-being of the officers is their main goal. What I think most of us are talking about in this scenario where there's an active shooter and active violence going on and our EMS crews are responding, we're talking more about a rescue task force model or RTF. These are EMS crews who are trained to use tactics. They're trained to integrate and interact with police for a very specific task, saving lives during active assailant incidents. And this is a very different focus from your traditional SWAT medics or tactical medics. So I, think that's a, I think that's a very important distinction to make. I think if we understand and underscore the need for medics using tactics, I think that'll go a long way in kind of clearing that confusion up. And in fact, here's an example of the difference between tactical medics and say medics using tactics. This person is clearly identified as a, as a medic, as a, as, a, as a rescue task force member. Um, oops, I don't know what this is. And um, <clears throat> what we're what we're talking about now is teaching them how to use these tactics in a in a situation uh, like an active shooter. I think what's easiest what's easiest for me to do as an educator is to take the medical response priorities and then teach it in the framework of zones of care. And what I mean by that is understanding that they have uh, direct threat care, indirect threat care, and casualty evacuation as zones of care. Let's look at direct threat or hot zone of care first. In, in, in a direct threat environment where there is an active and real threat of being killed or injured, either by a shooter, a knife-wielding attacker, anybody who needs to do you harm, the number one priority is actually not medical per se, it's threat suppression. Offensive actions to stop the killing, which ultimately does become medical, right? Um, if you stop the source of hemorrhaging, that's sometimes the best thing to do for trauma, stop the source of hemorrhaging, which is the bad guy doing the violence. So um, the current philosophy, again, from lessons learned like at Columbine, is you can't wait for SWAT. The very first armed officer, or if you're lucky, two, have to go in immediately, engage the shooter immediately, 
introduce pressure, which by itself, again, from lessons learned in history, will either force suicide or suicide by cop <clears throat> by or direct neutralization. Really the first and only objective, find the source of hemorrhaging and stop the killing of innocents. That phase of care should be very brief because now when our medical providers arrive, here is where we can really put them to work and say, we have a role for you. In the indirect threat care or uh, commonly known as warm zone area, where maybe it's not completely secure, but we can at least make it reasonably safe. We want to begin doing medical care. And, and really the number one priority, especially in penetrating trauma, is going to be hemorrhage control. Not ABC, but rather XABC, or exsanguinating hemorrhage, then airway bleeding and circulation. And especially in an environment where time is of the essence, you, all you want to do is stabilize them and get them out of there to a casualty evacuation. You really can't be doing direct pressure, pressure points, elevation. Really, it's got to go to tourniquets. And recently in the journal Pre-Hospital Emergency Care, this special contribution was published as an ACS COT evidence-based pre-hospital guideline for external hemorrhage control, where they very much support and advocate the uh, immediate use of a tourniquet for exsanguinating peripheral hemorrhage. And <clears throat> this is an example of the instructions that come with the combat application tourniquet. And I, and I chose the CAT to talk about because it's probably one of the more common ones out there. Um, there are other windless type tourniquets out there, such as the soft T or Special Operations Forces Tactical Tourniquet, very similar. Um, but I just picked one, and again, the CAT is one that's very common. And I think <clears throat> when you're teaching this to the end user, one of the things that I would do if I were rewriting this instruction manual is to take the instructions that here at step four, where it talks about until bright red bleeding is stopped, and move that up to step two, where you're pulling the self adhering band tight or the Velcro strap tight. Because really, one of the biggest misconceptions when you're teaching this skill to people, one of the biggest misconceptions is that the twisty thing does the work. And it doesn't. The windless rod does not do the work. The strap does all the work. The, the Velcro self adhering band has to do the work. And so one of the most important things is to teach them to apply it in such a way, whether one-handed or two-handed, that most of the bleeding should stop when you actually pull the self adhering band tight. And I think that's probably one of the more important teaching points. The windlass, twisting the windlass then, is going to be uh, finishing the job and uh, making sure that the distal pulse then is also obliterated. That's something else that both EMTs and paramedics sometimes forget, and frankly, sometimes some docs forget, is that, okay, you put the tourniquet on, the bleeding is stopped, and so you're done, but you fail to check for a distal pulse. And of course, if you don't obliterate the distal pulse, which I think the, the, what the windlass is good for probably doing is um, you're gonna create a compartment syndrome in very short order. So um, you wanna make sure that that is also part of your teaching method when you take this out to your law enforcement agencies or, or teach your crews how to use these things. And then um, uh, teach them how to then uh, secure it, get it on, and then move along. Something else that is a controversy is um, where to put the tourniquet. So there are a lot of books out there, a lot of instructors that still say put the tourniquet on two or three inches above the wound. Well, I, you know, that, that's not wrong per se. I will tell you that my feeling, my impression is that we really should be keeping it more simple and that we should just teach our providers to, to put the tourniquet on high and tight. High and tight, high and tight, high and tight for a couple reasons. Number one, it's easier to teach, I think, instead of trying to um, remember, is it two inches, is it three inches above the wound, what is it, just to teach people high and tight on, on the extremity 
is is easy. And number two, just from an anatomical reason, if you realize that, hey, there's two bones in the forearm and two bones in the leg versus one bone in the arm and one bone in the thigh, it's, it, it makes sense, right, that it's easier to compress a vessel against one bone. And I'll tell you, I was teaching this class uh, to a, a group of cops uh, maybe a couple weeks ago now, and one of the students raised his hand. He says, you know what? Uh, we were initially taught to put the tourniquets on two or three inches above the wound, but I am ex-military, and the wounds that we saw, we learned very quickly that we needed to just put it on high and tight because it wasn't working two or three inches above the wound. And so um, I appreciated his feedback on there. So I tell people, look, you know, put it here at, at point A, uh, not over the joint, but high and tight. Same here for the lower extremity. For the lower extremity, we can put it here um, above the thigh, on the thigh area, not over the knee or over the leg. And then of course we get, after we did do X, we get the A for basic airway maneuvers. And again, in a, in talking about a mass casualty incident where you have multiple casualties, there's probably gonna be very little role for direct laryngoscopy and intubation, but rather you wanna do basic airway maneuvers, otherwise they're expecting to move on to the next victim. For breathing, needle decompression is, is uh, something that every paramedic knows, obviously, but something that a lot of services don't appreciate is that they'll buy these 14 and 12 gauge needles even for their medics and put them on the truck. But these are the one and a quarter inch needles. And they are way too short. It's great for massive volume infusion, but they're lousy for needle decompression, even for skinny people, much less uh, what we call here lovingly the Midwest medium. Um, you've gotta have at least a three and a quarter inch uh, dart in order to to make it through the chest wall and actually do a needle decompression and, and and evacuate the total space. So that's really important as well. If you have purpose built needles instead of a vascular needle, that's also great. Um, this that one on the right uh, is an actual needle decompression needle made for uh, thor uh, needle thoracostomy and not for vascular access. That's also great. But what I like about that is that it's it's, it's in a case that hardened and it's not as easy to destroy, uh, not as easy to destroy in a bag that's used for EMS purposes. So that's also great. That's true. Um, also in B for breathing, uh, sucking chest wounds. You know, I, I remember when I first learned how to manage sucking chest wounds, because I've got a lot of gray hair, I was taught to do the whole three-sided dressing thing. And, and I'll tell you, um, the TCCC uh, committee recently published their new recommendation, which is, you know, three-sided dressing, it's, it's, it's clunky, and in the field, it's kind of hard to do. And for basic providers, sometimes they've got other things they need to be doing. And their, their, their new guideline is to look, just seal the sucking chest wound. If you have a vented chest seal, great. If not, just do a non-vented chest seal. Now, obviously, you need to monitor them, monitor them for the potential development of attention pneumonia. If you do, then their recommendation is, you know, burp it or do a needle decompression like we know how to do. So that's something that I teach my medics as well is don't worry about the whole cutting of three-sided dressing. Just if it's a sucking chest wound for real, seal it and monitor them for increasing dyspnea or difficulty breathing, and if so, decompress or burp the chest seal, and, and that's easier to me, I think. One of the reasons why I have a set of defib pads in the picture is because, I don't know about you, but I have a lot of expired AED pads sometimes, and um, instead of throwing them away, um, you can cut the cords off, put a big X on them, and throw them in your trauma bag. That's what I do with them. These, these AED pads are made to stick on diaphoretic people and then hairy surfaces, and so they're great. Hmm. So instead of throwing them away, I just kind of cut the cords off, put an X on them, and throw them in my uh, trauma bag. I have some extra chest seals there. A cheap way to do it. Uh, so X, A, B, and then C circulation, there really is, and especially in, in mass casualties, uh, a limited role for IV fluids. Well, I'll mention permissive hypotension in just a minute, but suffice to say, we've talked about uh, direct threat care or hot zone care, limited maybe to tourniquets, but mostly just getting off the X, getting off the target, and then indirect threat care or warm zone. This is really where the tourniquets are gonna come into play. Do your ABCs, 
but again, reminding your folks that these zones are not static. They're very fluid and they're very dynamic. So also remind them when you're talking about direct threat and indirect threat care zones, remind them that, um, hey, just because you're in an indirect threat zone now doesn't mean it's going to become a direct threat zone very quickly. So keep your head on a swivel, move quickly, do your XABCs and get out of there. So that's also something to really remind them to do. Rapidly extricate that patient to safety as quickly as possible. Um, one of the things that, that you can do, especially when you're extracting people, uh, if you can't get to the cold zone uh, or Kazavac zone immediately, is to set up a CCP or a casualty collection point. Um, something that I want to emphasize, because I saw this in training here locally, is that sometimes there's a thought that you have to set up a casualty collection point at every mass, uh, at every active shooter or, at, or active uh, violence event. And, and that's just not, that's not entirely true. Remember that a CCP, it's a function of time, distance, and the number of casualties. So not all situations will require it. So let's say that even if you had, say, eight or 10 victims, but it's in a in a relatively small contained area like a trailer home or something um, you may be able to exfil them out to a, a cold zone relatively quickly without having to set up a ccp but if you have a large office building for example or a big industrial complex where a disgruntled employee has gone through or a mall for example where you've got hundreds of yards of hallways and, and shopping and, and retail areas to cover, then having a CCP may in fact make sense because what the CCP does is it just helps you focus your limited resources for the greatest number of people. So obviously the first incoming units, you might have four to six paramedics or EMTs ready to help out. Well, if, you, if, if they're bringing 15 or 20 casualties out, a CCP would help kind of focus those resources. So again, that is something to, to think about. By the same token, if you have 100 paramedics and EMTs and 20 victims, well, there you've got plenty of resources and maybe you don't have to have a CCP per se. You can just immediately stabilize them and get them out to a casualty evacuation platform. Also remember that the CCP should not be set up in a cold zone. I've seen that done before as well on drills. And if you're able to get to the cold zone, well then get them to an ambulance. Um, if the, the, the value of having a casualty collection point in a warm zone is that it helps again focus these resources. You're not waiting for a scene to be secure before you're sending resources in. And you can start at least stabilizing and managing these folks until you can get them to the casualty, I'm sorry, the uh, casualty evacuation or cold zone area. So just consider that as well. A in the threat assessment is uh, assessment of, I'm sorry, the threat acronym is assessment of injuries and stabilization. And it's really important to go over this when you're talking about medical response priorities and active violence because everybody kind of focuses in on the the tourniquet part, ABCs, and then and then they forget that, hey, at each stage of their assessment, you really should take a quick moment to recheck them. So recheck the tourniquets, check for more bleeding, make sure it didn't move. Um, you know, a lot of law enforcement agencies are now, as a matter of routine, training and issuing the police officers tourniquets. So you, as a medical provider, may actually be receiving patients who are already, um, who already have a tourniquet placed. Well, you, you can't just assume that it's done properly. And even if it was done properly initially, a lot of things can happen dragging, uh, dragging somebody to a warm zone or, or a casualty evacuation point. So recheck them, make sure that the distal pulse is still obliterated, make sure they're not bleeding anymore. Make sure the airway is still patent, make sure the occlusive dressing hasn't come off, make sure they're not developing a tension pneumo um, and, and uh, that that needs to be readdressed. And then of course, now recheck their mental status, make sure that maybe they're not needing IV fluids 
now at this time. And of course, be alert to the fact that the situation is very fluid and very dynamic and that things change a lot. Something that, it, that I found in my experience is that um, when I give this talk to paramedics and firefighters and EMTs, I would say about 80% of them are totally gung-ho and, and, and supportive of this co whole concept of a rescue task force. And they say, where has this been? It's about time we were doing this. Um, we got, this is the right thing to do. Thanks for bringing it to us. I'd say another 10% are kind of on the fence. They're like, well, I got to think about this. It sounds pretty good, but, but maybe let me get some training first. Let me see how it goes and I'll think about it. But then there's probably about another 10% that says, absolutely not. I am not interested in going into an area that, that's a, a hot zone. Um, you can put me in the Kowski evacuation zone. Um, hey, Christian, has that been your experience too when, when you kind of teach this to folks? I do. I get the that, same impression that some most are ready to go, and then there's some who look at you like, no way. I am never. Yeah. This, this, you can tell me this yeah. is safe, but I'm not doing that. <laughs> right, exactly. And I think that's, that is – that has been my experience as well. And I say to them, look, that's great. We have a need for everybody in all three zones. And so, um, hey, it, we have a place for you. And so if, if there are folks that absolutely can't handle that thought of going into even a safe, warm, a warm zone that's relatively safe, then the, we need county evacuation zone medics as well. We need people in the ambulances that drive them to the trauma centers. And so mm -hmm. I remind them, look, even though your colleagues have, have done the, the management, maybe they've, they put a chest seal on, they put a tourniquet on, they've started an IV, you can't just drive them to the hospital. Make sure you recheck them and recheck your XABC priorities because that hasn't changed at all just because you're in the cold zone or the county evacuation zone. And when it comes to the IV fluid and the blood pressure, I think it's important to talk to them about this concept of permissive hypotension and that, look, we're, we're allowing the systolic to fall low enough to avoid exsanguination. Uh, obviously, we want the blood pressure to be high enough to maintain tissue perfusion and brain perfusion. The goal really is to avoid disruption of a clot by higher pressures and worsening of bleeding and coagulopathy by replacing blood with crystalloids. Um, because we know that doing that, like we used to, like we used to teach, and, and I'm, I'm ashamed to say that, you know, 20 years ago, I was teaching two large bore IVs, two liters of fluid before they get to the ER, because that's what we thought back then. Mm -hmm. But we see this cyclic over resuscitation that leads to the bleeding and, and paradoxical hypotension and of course, coagulopathies and all the other complications. And so... I think that's an important concept to teach them as well. Uh, using mental status as a barometer more than blood pressure and, and being careful about, uh, about crystalloids. Now, I also remind them that low blood pressure is not the goal. It's simply the compromise leading, uh, uh, bridging to emergency surgical, or, uh, surgical intervention. Once hemorrhage control is achieved, I think that normal, normalization of hemodynamic status might be appropriate but really it's hemorrhage control is the, is the goal. Something else, when I uh, give this talk to my pre-hospital crews in particular, I take the opportunity to, to just kind of hit on a couple of other causes of hypotension that we can't miss because especially in penetrating trauma, I have found that in every drill I've ever done, when someone's hypotensive and they've got penetrating trauma, they automatically assume just blood loss. And I say, hey, you can't forget Tension pneumo as another cause for hypotension. Don't put the blinders on and don't forget about things like tamponade as well as another cause for hypotension. And then I also remind them that, hey, when you're talking about permissive hypotension, there are some patients where this won't be appropriate, in particular, the uh, brain injured patient. And, and I ask them why, because they need that perfusion. You kind of need to make sure the brain is perfused in that, in that regard. Something else to mention, especially in the warm zone or indirect threat uh, care zone, and especially if they're in a casualty collection point receiving multiple victims, there is no role for CPR uh, because the, uh, 
again, using principles of triage, we're trying to get them uh, use the, our resources as best as possible and, and, and reserve those resources for those that who we think we can save. Penetrating trauma plus no signs of life, very, very low chance for survival anyway. And also, if they're not in the CCP, they're just, say, in an indirect threat zone with a pulseless patient, they can't do CPR very well because you have to have a high profile. You can't watch your surroundings. You can't maintain a watchful eye on the fluid dynamic status of the zone. And so it's just impractical as well, and it's not safe to do. I also take a moment now to throw in a disclaimer, uh, especially when I'm talking to a room of EMTs, medics, firefighters that may not be under our med control authority per se. I say, look, you've got to talk to your local medical director. They've got to be part of any decision surrounding unconventional trauma care and patient interventions. I certainly don't want to encourage anyone to do something that their medical director doesn't want them to do. So uh, open a dialogue with them. Discuss these scenarios with the medical director. Um, even better, how about you bring your local law enforcement um, planners into a discussion with your EMS service and take part in a local area drill before something happens. Say, hey, why don't we use our local mall, local school when it's out of session or something and, and set up a scenario and, and see how we, how we can um, address this. Finally, um, CASEVAC or CASE evacuation, the cold zone. When we're transporting, transporting to definitive medical care, I think it's um, important to emphasize that this is a completely secure area. There should not be any hostile threats here. And this is where you can begin to bring to bear more resources and then line those ambulances up and get them off the scene as quickly as possible. Here are some scenes from the San Bernardino shooting incident. Um, something that I think is worth emphasizing as well during these training sessions is that just because you have a direct threat or hot zone, indirect threat or warm zone, and then CASD evacuation or cold zone, uh, in that order, it doesn't mean that that's the order in which you have to think about it. Um, the first responding personnel on any mass casualty has to start thinking about this third phase right away. You have to start thinking about ingress and egress for the transport ambulances and for other responders coming in to help. I emphasize this to the law enforcement officers as well. Think about where you're putting the patrol cars because what what did we see in Aurora? Well, we saw we saw a lot of law enforcement cars pull up and stop right where they right where they were. They shut it off and lock the door and take the keys with them. And now you've got in, ingress and egress routes that are blocked. So uh, that's a natural thing to want to do unless you think about it, and unless you, unless you engage your local law enforcement about thinking about uh, these kind of strategies and tactics to think about bringing EMS resources sooner than later, um, it's just something that's not, that they don't think about because their priority is to stop that threat, which is fine, but we need to make sure we consider that as well. And I think that really underscores the importance of training together and pre-planning before something occurred because law enforcement has a very different mindset than fire and EMS. And that's fine, that's great, everyone has their role to do, but I think for too long we have siloed ourselves into your law enforcement and we're fire and EMS. And the reality is medical and law enforcement resources are going to be on the scene working together in these mass violence, mass casualty, active violence incidents. And so we might as well start thinking together, training together, and planning together. Uh, I will say that locally in, in, in our counties, our two neighboring counties, St. Louis County and St. Charles County, um, over the last couple of summers, we have been able to get the majority, actually, of EMS and fire personnel with police personnel to, for the first time, do a, a large-scale exercise together 
we took a big abandoned nursing home and we kind of used it as a as our our scene and we turned it into an office building we put lots of casualties in it and said all right you have an active shooter that went through here and you've got multiple casualties inside what are you going to do we let the cops do their thing and they started clearing the building and looking for the sound uh, listening for the sound of violence and going to the threat but then we also had multiple EMS resources coming in with more police, and we say, okay, now we have reports that the shooter is is um, contained to this wing of the building, but we've got at least 12 to 15 people shot in the other side of the building. What are you going to do now? And it was very interesting to see how they formed up teams and how they um, formed up a rescue task force using people who have never met before and who've never worked together before. And it was surprising actually to see how well they performed together as a team because they understood the concepts of uh, RTF model that we talked about in the didactic portion before that. We, had, we actually had them watch a training video first before coming to the practical session. And it was really, a high yield exercise. I would encourage everyone to kind of think of the same model. It was really, it was really well received as well. I think they all realized that this is how it's going to be in real life. We're not silos. We're not working separately. We have to work together. Uh, there is a number of places. There are a number of places where you can go to get resources for, for preparation and, and things like this. I'll say one of the nicer ones is on the AMR website where they have pooled together active assailant resources for EMS and dispatch centers. If you go to the website, these are all free of charge. There's no password needed. Just click on any of these links and you can download the TCCC abstracts. You can download um, the RAMS uh, paradigm. You can download a bunch of other active shooter and complex attack resources. Um, again, free of charge. Um, I will say that, unfortunately, active killer incidents will continue. Uh, again, we just saw our most recent episode yesterday in Berlin. It's imperative that we all change our mindset from the if to when and prepare for it. I think we have to regularly dialogue with local law enforcement and agree on response practices for these events. Everyone's going to be a little bit different, so I think it's important to to really train with those responders that you're going to see on an actual call. And I think a tabletop exercise is a great place to start. Um, unfortunately, I see a lot of jurisdictions stop right there. They'll do a tabletop and they'll say, great, we'll put this on paper and we're, we're done. And uh, anybody who's ever done a, a real drill based on a tabletop knows that it's nothing like the tabletop exercise. You, you'll never really find your um, true weaknesses until you expose them in an exercise. Um, it's got to be real time. It's got to be hands on with the people that are going to be responding. And it, it'll be better if you can actually use a, a, a local building or a local school um, that can be cleared out and, and used for purposes of training. Um, but it, it's got to go beyond the tabletop. And, and I think by doing so, uh, you will contribute to the resiliency of your community and increase the number of lives salvaged uh, when these when these events occur. I really thank you for your time, and um, I think we do have time for uh, Q and A at this time. Well, I'll start off. I guess I gotta uh, emphasize one thing you said is is um, making this kind of uh, interaction between police, fire, and EMS, a local activity. We brought together Syracuse Fire, Police, and some local EMS agencies a couple times over the past year, and we've talked about amongst our the EMS doctors here in Syracuse, um, how do we get everyone, you know, think about the whole county, and the, we have a five-county region, and how do we extend that kind of training out to everyone? And we kind of came to the realization of we just don't have the time or the time, the money, or the, the uh, just the effort avail available to make it happen. And we've been kind of pushing for local agencies to do it themselves, talk to the local towns, talk to local groups, and make it happen. And actually, it did happen for one of my local EMS agencies where they talked to the police by themselves and 
and kind of made something happen. And um, it's, it's really got to be a local, a local push. I'm, I'm glad there's CONTOMS. I'm glad there's national state. For New York State, we have a statewide um, um, program that people can attend. But it's really going to be a local effort to, to make it work for everyone, in my, at least my opinion. Um, I guess I'll ask one question. Um, I've seen a lot of questions amongst on the uh, listservs kind of about do you arm medics for these type of situations? Uh, I'll ask your opinion if you have any thoughts about that before I share my, my opinion. <laughs> wow, that, that's, a, that's a really good question. I'll tell you, that's a really hot button issue. Just like, um, just like training for these incidents is local, all politics is local, and this is definitely, uh, it's a big political issue as well. I'll tell you that, um, well, let me start first with just the SWAT medic model. So mm -hmm. for those medics who are actually assigned to a police department or a, a SWAT team, there, this question comes up, do we arm them or not? Yeah. And, I, and I have to tell you, from a practical standpoint, it is really difficult um, and arduous, well, not difficult, but it is very arduous to defend officer-involved shootings where the first thing they subpoena is training records and weather conditions during those training scenarios and, and lighting conditions and how many rounds did they fire, what was the last time they were in this kind of situa training situation. And these are officers who shoot a lot, and, and the SWAT guys shoot 10 times more than patrol division does. Now, put a medic there who is maybe not a sworn officer who might be deputized and authorized to carry a weapon and they shoot and kill somebody, um, I, I'm sure that it would be and could be defended, but that's really gonna be a, a challenge. Um, and I, it's very hard unless that medic has the same amount of training, um, the same amount of rounds, the same expectations, um, and is also sworn, it, it, it's, hard to, it's hard to justify. Now, I will say that there are pl plenty of teams where the medics are armed and it works fine for them and their attorneys are good with it and it, it works and, and that's great. So, uh, you know, I don't know that I can say there's a right or wrong answer for that. Now, yeah. now to apply this to the general rescue task force model medic, say just a firefighter who's on duty or an EMT or a paramedic who's on duty and they respond they're not part of a SWAT team. They're just, they're just the initial first responders to an incident. How, in the, how do they get armed? So I, I don't think there are many police, I'm sorry, I don't think there are many fire EMS agencies that allow their personnel to carry on duty, um, concealed or otherwise. And so what are they going to do? Are, are they going to arm themselves through the police? Are they going to just have a locker uh, go back to the state. I, I just don't know how that works yeah. and logistically. So I think there are a lot of pros and cons to arming the medics. Don't get me wrong. I think though uh, in, in my team, for example, we are, we're not armed, um, but we have very good and well-practiced protocols for medic security. And we have an officer assigned to the medic whose only job is rear security and medic security and their jobs to go with the medic and and they know that so that's my long answer to your good question fair enough i don't know what what are your what's your take on it um i, I feel i mean even though i've been through the military and some some arms training with then and done some arms training with with our ems fellow and with our swat team uh me personally i don't feel I feel proficient enough to defend myself. I'm not proficient enough to to do it under a high pressure situation, and I'm not sure I would trust myself to to be armed or to uh, or not shoot myself or cause an accident. To be honest, um, that would uh, that's always been my biggest concern. I think I would extend that off to my to my pre hospital providers as well. We're just not trained um, in general um, to do that kind of work. I can see the arguments for, but I think the arguments con are, are pretty strong that if you're right, not doing it all the time, it's not your area of expertise, you're not training on it all the time like police are, I'd be very hesitant to, to have folks doing that. But 
Right. And and I think something else to kind of consider is that concealed carry and even even if your providers are very well trained and very proficient and comfortable with a firearm, um, using it under color of law, mm-hmm. which is a, a legal term that basically it, it raises the standard upon which you're performing a given action. Um, it's not the same thing as when you're in your house and someone's kicking in your door. They're, they're, they're at the, it's a different thing. Um, again, I, I'm not saying I'm opposed to it at all. I'm just saying the, there are a lot of other circumstances and, and complications that people don't often think about when they want to arm the medics. And it's, uh, it's just something else to think about. Okay. Uh, we do have one question from Brian who wanted to ask you a question. Sure. So, uh, along the same lines, can you hear me okay, by the way? Yes. Yeah, sounds great, Brian. Um, I, I totally understand the idea of not only how comfortable is someone in that position to not only defend themselves, but to act under that, like you said, the rule of law and the burden of training that comes with arming medics. Mine is more of a, um, a defensive question in the sense that what about having the availability of vests for those medics that are performing tactics who are not tactical medics? People in the warm zone, you know, in, in the essence that you were discussing of you know, it's isolated to this wing, but we have several people injured in this other part of the building. Um, if that situation is still fluid, are they are they given vests or where they kept? And is that something that you've seen as kind of a midpoint? Right. Yes. Um, I they they have the the model that we use in our local area in St. Louis is the the rescue task force medics who are the first responders. They're not the SWAT medics per se. They go in only with law enforcement and they do get a ballistic vest Hmm. and um, they go in as, as part of that team and they are never left alone. Then they, they go only with law enforcement. Their every movement is coordinated by law enforcement. And actually you remind me of something else to bring up that, which I forgot, which is when you're doing these RTF type trainings, it is imperative to remind everyone, especially the white helmets that, From the beginning to the end, this is a law enforcement operation, period. Mm -hmm. This is not a fire operation. This is not an EMS operation. This is a law enforcement operation that we are augmenting that response, and we are doing what we can to do to save lives from the medical perspective. But understand this. It's a law enforcement operation. And so they don't move. They don't go anywhere. They don't exfil without the say-so from their law enforcement escorts. Right. And that, that the way the rescue task force model works is that it really is an integrated response with law enforcement. So it's not independent at all. So I hope that answered your question, Brian. They, they absolutely do go in with, with ballistic protection, at least in our local program. And, and they go in only with armed escorts. And, and even if it's a collection, casualty collection point, there has to be officers assigned to the CCP and they don't leave the CCP. They are protecting the CCP, period, and the medics inside. Thank you. And we had one other question from, I'm going to butcher this, uh, Kamenir? It's Rich Kamen. Rich Kamen. Oh, okay. Hey. What's up, uh, Rich? Hey, Dave. It's, it's a great talk, and uh, it was great to listen to. And, you know, the only thing I was going to – it's it's always uh, – it's it's pretty consistent that folks ask about arming uh, medical providers. And, and my caveat when I talk to people um, is that you can be as proficient and comfortable as you want. You can have a team that is comfortable with your proficiency. Um, and, and maybe even the law enforcement team that you work with might want you to be uh, armed for whatever reason. It fits into uh, their schema of operations. What I would say is for a medical provider that is not sworn formally, please, please, please make sure that the investment in legal representation is made so that if and when you are ever called upon to shoot somebody as righteously as it may be, that there is that the law enforcement team that you're working with has embraced you as someone that deserves the same level of coverage as any one of their officers. Mm. Because that to me is, I, I think everything that, that uh, David said was correct. You know, the expectations on proficiency and um, quite frankly, the difference in expectations between 
a formal tactical environment and a civilian environment like you're in your house protecting yourself, very different. But man, this is just going to be an enormous burden on a private citizen, most private citizens, I think, um, to uh, have to shell out and take the time off and possibly go to jail um, <laughs> for doing something which might be absolutely reasonable, but because they don't have the same representation within uh, the structure, um, they're going to be up the creek. Interesting. Good point. Totally agree, Rich. And um, uh, by the way, Rich came in one of the members of the Hartford Consensus, but um, I, I totally agree, Rich. Um, and, and I will tell you that my MOU um, specifically states, and the MOU with all of our medics who are employed by our ambulance district, we have a formal MOU that specifically says all activities um, while on a SWAT operation are covered by the county's both indemnification and all legal representation will be assumed by the county. Mm. Um, and, and and they have said that even though the medics are not armed, and um, and I'll actually say that this came up during uh, the Ferguson incidents here locally, that, um, hey, if for some reason we get overrun and, and, and an officer goes down and you have to defend yourself, pick up his weapon and defend yourself if you need to. And we were told that specifically. So, um, and, 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 I, and I think that's something that is absolutely true. Um, the, the medic has to make uh, absolute assurances and preferably in writing that mm -hmm. they are covered by the agency's legal representation and have the same protection as the officers. Yeah. Good point. Yeah, there's just, yeah, there's, you know, so many ways to skin this cat. My, the MOUs that I have with two of the three teams I work with specifically say I will not be armed. Um, and we have not embraced the whole zombie concept. Um, but I think it's important. And I think David's point is having it ironed out so that everyone has a clear expectation is key. That's a good point. Yeah. Excellent. I guess uh, for the group, anything, any other questions before we wrap this up? Okay. All right, I'll stop it there. Uh, I want to thank uh, Dr. Tan for speaking today. Um, always a fascinating topic that that uh, uh, always makes me worried when I think about it or send my kids to school and watch the news. And uh, I think it's one that we'll be probably dealing with for some time to come. Uh, but I want to thank everyone for attending. Uh, keep in mind, next month, uh, we'll get back to the last Tuesday of the month. And David Cohn uh, from Yale will be talking about emergency medicine dispatch. Um, if anyone wants to volunteer, we haven't got a good 2017 uh, calendar yet for speakers. Uh, if you have a good topic to discuss or a hot topic to uh, present uh, or a good case to uh, share with us, uh, just message me, uh, email me, um, and uh, we'll get you on the schedule. Otherwise, thanks again to Dr. Tan, and uh, we'll see you next month. Thanks, everyone.